Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. In this episode, Dave's got a new paper, and once again, it is on bite traces. So, hope you're going to like it. Nom, nom, nom. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of It's a Terrible Lizards podcast with me, Izzy Lawrence, and more importantly, Dr. Dave Tone from St. Mary's University. This is Queen Mary's. Queen Mary shush, University. Shush, I did. This is why I practiced. And I got it wrong. <laughs> and it really shows. <laughs> oh, it's been one of those days, Dave. It's been one of those days already. So I, I apologise. And um, Queen Mary University, obviously. Anyway, we're going to talk about papers today, aren't we? So, Dave, what is paper? That is my question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, I'm afraid for, for, for long-time listeners, it's a regular day. has got a new paper out. Didn't have anything else to talk about this month, so we're going to talk about my new paper. Yay! But it is... One I'm really quite excited by, and it's something which has been just dating for literally years, and in part was linked to having gone to Utah. So part of my Utah trip was kind of based around this, although the paper was done before I went. That's partly why I was so excited to finally go, was to kind of link it all together in my head of this work, and it did certainly help filling in some of the so end of it. So importantly, you went to Utah, and you didn't have to rewrite your paper. Which suggests, yeah, basically, suggests that you probably got it right. <laughs> yeah, but meeting some people and, and speaking to them about their work, particularly Julie McHugh, and seeing some of the major quarries, some of which had yielded the specimens that are in this paper and things like that is, you know, you will never get that context until you go. And it's amazing how seeing something, which you've already seen hundreds of photos of and spoke to people hundreds of times, suddenly it like clicks when you get it in front of you. So it really was very, very cool. So what is the paper about, Dave? Because so far... I've got that it's about Utah. I haven't said anything other than Utah. Yeah, yeah I know. So it's bite marks. Uh, my One of my traditional areas, bites on bones by theropod dinosaurs, but in this case on sauropods, because when I've done this before, I've almost always done tyrannosaurs, in part because of that very factor that you've got, which is tyrannosaurs, or certainly the, the tyrannosaurs you get towards the end of the Cretaceous, are living in environments where basically they are the only big carnivores. And in the case of T-Rex, it is the only big carnivore. And therefore, when you find a bite mark on a bone, you pretty much know what it was. And that's really important when you want to try and interpret behaviour and things that are going on. If we go to Africa and you find a random bone with some bites on it, and you don't know if it's a lion or a leopard or a hyena or a hunting dog or even a crocodile or some, you know, several other different things that it could be it's very hard to then say oh well we think lions are doing this or at least we think big cats are doing this and it just becomes some millange of carnivores are doing something and that's why i've always favored the tyrannosaurs the other side of that is the fact that tyrannosaurs in general leave more bites on bones than other big theropods do so that means you've actually got more stuff to work from why why do tyrannosaurs leave more bites on bites? Is it just because they're getting in deeper? They got bigger teeth. So they they they're better adapted for it. So you know the later tyrannosaurs, they've got these really big overpowered heads with lots of jaw muscles, and they've got really big thick teeth. So they're clearly quite resistant to very high bite forces. And there's lots of studies that show that 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 correlates. And they've got these specialized feeding teeth in the premaxilla at the front of the jaw. They do this weird scrape feeding thing to scrape muscle off bone and that is obviously going to leave bite marks so it's been in my head for a long time to go and look at a sauropod dominated fauna because we do have bite marks on sauropods we have sauropods with shed teeth from theropod feeding traces it's not that these are unknown and i've described a couple as well but doing something close to a systematic survey of lots of them where we have a fair understanding of what's going on no one's done it and now we have <laughs> So I'm just going to say, um, obviously, for those listening who are, aren't familiar with all things, tyrannosaurs think T-Rex, but there's lots, several different species, and sauropods think pig with a snake running through it, or diplodocus. <laughs> yes, and diplodocus is, is one of the animals. So, you know, the Morrison Formation is about 150 million years old, late Jurassic, big swathe of North America covered, and yeah, there's a lot of famous things there, but it's very, very, very sauropod heavy. You've got Diplodocus and Brachiosaurus and Apatosaurus and Camarasaurus, particularly common, and a whole bunch of others, uh, Rebeccasaurids and some others. Um, I think one quarry now definitively has six different taxa in it. So it's not just... They, they were well spread out, okay? You know, they're not always going to be in exactly the same time at the same place, but that certainly was the case. There are absolutely places in the Morrison where you can identify multiple different species together. 
And so these were absolutely the dominant herbivores running around through this ecosystem. They've all been nibbled on. Pretty much. That's what we found. So I should, at this point, point to my other authors. Um, so I'm the corresponding author or senior author on this paper, so my name is at the end. But the person who did an awful lot of the work is a guy called Roberto Lai, or Roberto Lie. I'm afraid I don't know, because I've only ever seen his name written down, and he's the University of Moderna in Italy. So I don't actually know quite how I'm supposed to say his name. Um, Emmanuel Schott, who's over at the American Museum of Natural History, and actually Mark Norell contributed as well. And then Christoph Hendrick, and Matt Weddle also had a part in this paper, but um, myself through various bits that I'd done in a literature survey, and then Roberto and Emmanuel in particular, those two were sorting through collections, and in particular the AMH collection, because the American Museum of Natural History has tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of sauropods, all excavated, at least mostly excavated in that kind of late 1800s, early 1900 window, that bone war era race for discovery. And so they literally have hundreds of specimens. And so going through that entire collection and sorting through bones and looking for bite marks is a huge undertaking. And this was Roberto's, I think it was his master's thesis, did this as a project. Emmanuel and I were talking about this and he went, oh, well, I've got a student who might be able to oh, help no. out. And then the whole thing Poor grew from there dug into this to be down in the you know cellars picking up bits of rock and going it's this sauropods and has anything nibbled on it pretty much yeah so what one of the limitations we know is we couldn't look at everything properly and this is a real problem you know a sauropod femur can be the size of me you can't just pick it up and turn it over and and check every angle you know, let alone go over hundreds of these with a hand lens looking for very fine marks and very fine striations so it was in the grand scheme of things, thorough, but perhaps a little bit coarse. Um, but again, that's that's a classic problem that you have with this, with tyrannosaur-dominated faunas. They're dominated for the herbivore side of hadrosaurs and ceratopsians. And those things are big, but usually a fraction of the size of sauropods. And so their bones are much, much easier to pick up and turn over. It's one of over. those lovely things where I realised, like, if we were studying something like bats... You could say, oh, there are tons and tons of samples, but actually tons is the wrong word, whereas with sauropods, tons is the correct. We're talking about tons. I mean, yes, <laughs> fossilised sauropod bones. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen some femora that are you know, literally thick end of two metres yeah. long. And so, yeah, they weigh and they're solid rocks. <laughs> they're probably a couple of hundred kilos. For a single element. And you're saying Roberto is not strong enough to pick that up? And... Uh, yeah, he, you know, he should have done more bodybuilding going into the project. He should have been lifting two, 300 kilo specimens with one hand whilst holding the hand lens with the other and making sure the bones didn't break because that, that's trivial in a basement with no lights. <laughs> So what was, the, what was the thing you were trying to prove here? Because, like, obviously, I'm imagining there will be some bites on some bones, but... Are they old bites? Are they bites that when they were juvenile that then got bigger? Or are they bites after they've been eaten? Or are they bites because they've been attacked? Or are they bites just because they want to say hello? I don't know. I, I love Dave's face. It's like, I can tell you this. Shut up, woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you stop asking the question, I'll answer it. So a bunch of different things, really. What I would say is this this is a paper, and I have a few of these, which I I think of them as being investigative in the sense that, you know, we, we talk about the formal process of science, and we have talked about yeah. the formal process of science, of, you know, observation, hypothesis, hypothesis testing, learn new knowledge. And in this case, I'd say we're on the first kind of two steps of observation and hypothesis. We haven't really done formal hypothesis testing, but what we have done is made a whole bunch of observations which we think tell us something and allow us to formulate those hypotheses. And so they could be tested. So I don't think this work is unscientific, which not on this paper, other papers I've done like this, some referees have gone, well, it's not really science if you're not testing a hypothesis. And my counter argument to that is we publish anatomical descriptions all the time. There's no hypothesis testing there. We are finding data and telling the world what it is. I think the same thing's going on here. So it's very interesting and very leading work, but it also does then allow us to be a little bit more free form in the sense that because we're not testing hypotheses per se, we're kind of looking to see what patterns there might be and what that could tell us and what we could do with it. We could cast our net wide and kind of approach this in a number of different ways. And that's when it, you know, we start generating really interesting kind of knowledge. So yeah, we surveyed the literature for stuff that was out there. We surveyed some other bits and bobs of collections that we knew we had seen and things we had looked at. 
but something like three quarters of the data in the paper is basically just straight going through the AM and H collection. And it means we had in the real, as, as I say, in the realm of, I'm just, I'm just going to yeah, check because I can't remember the damn don't. number. So yeah, it was, it was six, it was 68 bones had bite marks on them. And I think they came from about 45 different animals. Wow. But that's having checked several hundred. Yeah, but still, even if it's several hundred, if it's if if it's a thousand, forty-five out of a thousand is pretty significant. So they're high numbers. So that's the first thing to mention is when you look at tyrannosaur faunas, the classic number that comes up is ten to twelve percent, maybe getting up to fifteen, eighteen. So if you collect a hundred random bones from the surface of a tyrannosaur dominated fauna you will find in the realm of 10 to 18 of them with a bite mark on them. In other words, that's really quite a lot. They, they really are common. It, it's fairly easy to go and pick them up. And that number really comes from uh, a guy called Arnold Jacobson, who was working in the late 90s, early 2000s. He was Danish, but working in Canada at the time. And he did this big survey of stuff at the Royal Tyrrell Museum. Of course, we mentioned the Tyrrell Locks. I spent a lot of time there as well. And basically, that's where that number comes from. And that number has hung around ever since because it's the one time someone did a survey really like that. And that was a large part of what we're trying to do is like, well, let's do what Jacobson did. We look at everything that's going and then see how many bites are on it. And the first thing we find is that the numbers here aren't a million miles off. They're like eight-ish percent. So at the bottom end of that 10 plus range, but pretty close to it and there is an idea and even i've perpetuated that because it's based on what we had looked at before that bite marks in non-tyrannosaur faunas are really rare and in tyrannosaur only faunas they're really common well they certainly appear to be more common in tyrannosaur faunas but once you start systematically looking through all the bones yeah you find quite a few more and it turns out that they're rather more common than we thought they were so while there is still a difference between the two and we can get more into that in a bit the idea that tyrannosaurs are absolutely leagues ahead in terms of their bone bite leaving tracingness compared to in this case an allosaur dominated fauna you've got uh, allosaurs you've got ceratosaurs uh, and you've got large megalosauroids those still between them are putting in a hefty number of bites so in other words, bites are probably more common on sauropods than we think they are. That's the first takeaway. The inevitable and instant caveat to that is how this sampling was done. A, because our sampling isn't that thorough because it simply can't be. But also, although the AM&H collection samples from a whole bunch of different sites in Utah, it ultimately, large chunks of it come from only a couple. So we're kind of surveying two sites. And that's important because when you look through data that is out there on single sites so a paper that came out while we were working on this but obviously predates us because it was published last year or even 2021 now we've, we've been working on this for like six years was the mygat moor quarry in utah which is one of the ones i visited and what so i didn't visit the the quarry but i visited the collection and in there huge numbers of their bones have bites it's incredibly common loads and loads and loads and loads of them i, I think it was up to like 15 20 percent in other words tyrannosaur plus levels but that appears to be a definitive drought assemblage where a whole bunch of animals died, they were exposed, everything got to them, everything was feeding on them, absolutely destroyed them. That might be somewhat artificial because that's not your typical random animal dying or random animal being predated. The flip side of that is the legendary Carnegie Quarry, so the great big long wall of bones, which again I did visit, and that one is the flip side. That has something like the thick end of a thousand bones in it once you include the stuff that was taken out as well as the stuff that still remains and we know of exactly one bone that has bites wow. on it um and that's a small diplodocid femur that i actually described a few years ago in part because it was like oh my god it's the only one in the carnegie quarry that makes it quite interesting so what we probably have got for sauropods is or at least maybe not sauropods maybe the morrison is We've got sites where predators and scavengers basically couldn't access them and so had none, and sites where they were supremely accessible or were actively drawing them in where you have loads. And so that means that our average problem, what we've got mostly doesn't include those two quarries, but it means that our average of 10 could easily be over or under exaggerated if we have over or under sampled from one of those two quarry types and we don't know. I was taught Tyrannosaurus rex was a scavenger people getting very excited right now. Large carnivorous dinosaurs were both predators and scavengers. That's basically definitive from lots of different 
studies and lots of different baseline evidence, there's no reason to think any of them weren't. So for now, at least, if I say predator or I say scavenger or say theropod, they're pretty much synonymous in the context of this discussion. I just wanted um, to clear that up. So, so that, that so that's you were, the... I could see people getting quite excited that you were about to announce, which proves that they never bit any femurs or nope, live the animals. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll ruin it for them. So yeah, short version, there are probably a lot more bites on sauropods than we think, but equally quite how common that really is. We need a, a better survey than ours, to be honest. And that's, I suspect, not necessarily impossible but very, very difficult because, again, so many of these bones have entered so many different collections at different times, been handled differently. They're scattered across the US uh, and Canada and other places. We've got some of that stuff in the UK, for example, that really, truly doing A, a systematic survey of them and B, getting the original information about what the state of the quarry was like 150 years ago, certainly 100 years ago, is going to be difficult, bordering on impossible. And so I have some caveats with my own paper, but I'm not sure anyone could do much better without putting in literally 20 times the work. And that's probably not worth it for a study like this. And you've also got the random sampling of what gets fossilised in the first place. So it's all very... Well, which which isn't Uh, random. And that's another of the issues. The the, the sampling is non-random. You know, small bones, end of tail, finger bones, teeth, bits of skull... Those are very easy to wash away because they're much smaller. They're very easy to lose or not be collected or be destroyed in the collecting process, particularly for big, heavy bones. And when people are often using dynamite and big pickaxes and stuff, not being very careful. But also they're potentially easier to eat. Um, You know, if you are a big carnivore and you bite a chunk out of the, you know, someone's bum equivalent, that could literally be a half ton block of muscle. You're not going to take any bone. If you bite the end of a tail, you're probably just going to bite the end of the tail off and swallow it whole and those bones are gone. So, yeah, we have massive non-random preservation and then we quite possibly have non-random collection at the other end as well. And so between those, you're putting in a load more of of biases. Uh, So one of the things we see, which is very, very difficult to really know quite how accurate our data is, is we have tried to do a small analysis of how frequently certain elements show bite marks because our logic being that areas that have a lot of meat on them will tend to be fed on first. We do know about this. These are carcass consumption patterns. I've talked about these repeatedly. No, you have not um, repeated. But in general, You've talked this about is... it, I think, once before on the podcast. And that was... Oh, like, I've definitely done nah. it more than once. But anyway, there, there, are, there are more or less systematic feeding patterns that you can see in... Not just mammals and reptiles, but other carnivores as well. So this is—I mean, cats are meant to go after your lips, lips yeah, and eyelids. That's a bit grim. And I believe as well they've done things on domestic cats where they don't even wait till they're hungry. They just—you die, and within twenty minutes they will eat your face. <laughs> <laughs> quite, 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 because, because cat. cats. Um, yeah. Fundamentally, big carnivores have these fairly systematic feeding patterns where they tend to go for the biggest muscle blocks, then stuff like the viscera, and then. Can I ask else. A, a basic question? Because we have like 14 year olds listening and also you have an Isley listening. What do you mean by viscera? Internal organs, but particularly Guts. rich stuff liver. like the heart and liver, kidneys and some of the intestines. Intestines are often really important for carnivores because actually they get a lot of nutrients and important rare stuff from the partially digested mm. plant material that the herbivores ate. Um, so that's that's quite a neat one. But it means that, you you know, we can look at some of these and go, OK, which bones were getting bites? And does that match any kind of systematic pattern? The first problem you've got, sorry, yes, this gets, comp- there are caveats to the caveat because this is complicated, is so something like the femur and the base of the tail, those are the biggest blocks of muscle on the animal because it's the big muscle that drives the legs, basically. So that's probably going to be the very first thing bitten. So maybe that would have more bites than normal because it's the biggest block of muscle and that's where you're going to bite. On the other hand, because there's maybe half a ton of muscle there, you probably have to bite it a hell of a lot before you end up anywhere near a bone. So actually maybe they'll have less than normal. So the exact same behavior could generate more bites or less bites and we don't know quite what they're doing and quite how they're feeding and that's a very, very hard thing to work out but we can at least look at it and what we do tend to find is you did get quite a lot of bites on things like the femur and the pelvis uh, and also the shoulder 
because those are areas which are going to contain lots and lots of bites. But you also got a fair number on lots of little things like toes and bits of the fingers and uh, end tail bones and bits of ribs. And it's like, okay, but now that's the almost the same thing flipped over in that they probably get fed on last, but when you do, you're almost immediately going to leave a bite on them. And on top of that, you've also got the phenomenon that they're more common. If we're looking at raw numbers, you know, there's five fingers and five toes for every humerus and every femur. There's about 30, 40 ribs compared to only two femora and two bits of pelvis. So you've got much higher numbers of some bones than others, which may preserve more often than others, but might be bitten more often than others. And also, if you think about the way, if an animal dies and is collapsed on its side, you can only get to the top one, whereas you can get to all of the fingers, presumably. Yeah, and, and certain areas of things, so like the head of the femur is basically stuck inside the socket of the pelvis, so it's probably going to be inaccessible. Yeah, a body, though, that's been lying and breaking down for weeks or months probably has come apart and other things have got to it. If you're a very big predator, you can probably move some of those bigger bones around, whereas a small one can't. So yeah, we've got this kind of horrible Venn diagram of contingencies where we you know, all these different effects that might be pushing those numbers up or down. And we know those kind of levers are there to push those numbers up or down, but we really don't know how much or at all any given one of them is going up and down, let alone what they're all doing and what intersects at the middle point. So it's, re- it's yeah, as I say, it's kind of really interesting that we've got this data and it probably does tell us a bit about certain feeding patterns, but it's got these horrible set of uncertainties attached to it which really aren't easy to work out at all and therefore leaves us in a bit of a we've got loads of bites i'm not sure quite how much it tells so so what else did you sort of find so i thought i thought you said he was he was looking at everything not just femurs then of these sauropods Ro- yeah Ro- Ro- roberto and emmanuel were were going through basically every bit of the collection to look at every single bone that they could access wow. and look at them and then so things like what group do they belong to some of these things haven't been id'd before these guys got to them this is the problem with century old collections where we just don't have that many paleontologists going back to previous conversations we we've, we've, we've definitely had on the podcast of people like why is there no list of like every dinosaur specimen ever and it's like because even collections like the am and h are sitting on stuff a century old that they haven't got around to cataloging so curious enough, we don't even know what's in our own museums, let alone global or national kind of level. But you stuck to they stuck to sauropods only, though. Yeah, it, this is this is a systematic survey of sauropods, and of course that then is also potentially slightly different to again the the tyrannosaur numbers because those tyrannosaur numbers were every bone that we had available that tyrannosaurs might have bitten, whereas here we're artificially excluding stegosaurs and the small one if the pods and some of the other stuff that that's floating around at the time we're just looking at sauropods so yeah if we included those maybe those are bitten even more and that bumps the number up maybe they're bitten even less and that drops the number further down that's certainly something you know there's a study someone could immediately go and do is pick up the rest of the stuff oh i'm sure they're jumping to do that spend the rest of the next six years in a basement counting stuff for you <laughs> Just doing the same well there's a, the, the good news is there's far less of them and the second bit of good news is they're far easier to look at because even a really big stegosaurus femur is about half the size of a sauropod one so it's much less work these patterns as i say infuriatingly don't necessarily tell us very much but again this is also partly why you publish this stuff and put it out there because i'll be very surprised if people don't take one look at this and go oh that matches what i've seen in this quarry or ah that's a weird bite that you've got there but i've seen that before this is a pattern there's you keep seeing that on these types of ribs or in camarasaurus or in the ones in the north of the morrison but not in the south of the morrison or one of these kinds of patterns so yeah this is why we we talk about just how important data is just getting that information out there even if we're not entirely sure what it means and what we can do with it, could be absolute gold to the next person who gets can to Can I it. just ask a really, really like annoying question for an audio format, which is how can you tell what, say, a, t- a, 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 a tyrannosaurus bite is or a scrapey tooth action is compared to like a claw of something else or just it ran into a tree once? <laughs> so... Well, so compared to claw marks, so there's been some tyrannosaur bite marks 
which have been interpreted as claw marks from foot fighting. And I don't believe them for a second because they're very unconvincing in the sense that it, I think it requires a kind of, well, if the head was at this angle and if the foot was at that angle, then maybe this going in could be a claw rather than a tooth. But I can't see any real difference between those the, You're just than the anti teeth marks. Karate dinosaurs, um, Dave. Yes, because I'm not sure T Rex really thought it was a good idea to try and put one foot on the head of another T Rex and not fall over while it's fighting them. Um, in terms of the kind of animals we're talking about, which do have relatively big, long arms with relatively big, sharp claws on them, unlike big tyrannosaurs. Again, probably they just weren't. I mean, claws are just not as strong as teeth. You know, enamel is incredibly hard. Keratin on claws simply isn't. If you're trying to put deep scratches into bone, you're mostly going to blunt your claws rather than cut into the bone, whereas with teeth they will. Um, but the real thing that does it is just the patterns. With teeth marks, what we mostly are seeing is rows of parallel or nearly parallel grooves cut in the bone, which actually are a decent size, sorry, diameter and spacing that matches what we see of the spacing of teeth in the jaws of large carnivores. And there are these very distinctive ways in which the bone fragments around the edges. And so that's how you can tell that A, the bone wasn't healed, but also that it's some kind of real injury and effect rather than some kind of natural break or snap or anything like that. So they're fairly easy to see. And again, we actually have, in the grand scheme of things, of how teeth act on bone, Bone is built pretty much the same way everywhere and everything. Teeth are built pretty much the same way in everywhere and everything. Bite marks of lions don't look that dissimilar to bite marks of dinosaurs. Because, again, it's a big, sharp tooth covered in enamel with a lot of power going against a grain of bone. And that bone will tend to break in the same way. And we actually see that. So once you've kind of got your eye in and you've seen a few, yeah, there are always ones. And I've seen stuff on tyrannosaurs. In, including actually um, Titus, the the one I did on the exhibition at Nottingham. There's a couple of things on that which people have said are bite marks. I'm very unconvinced. I can see where they're coming from, but I'm very unconvinced. There there are some that are very uncertain, but but the clear ones are incredibly obvious, and you you, you know you're not going to mix them up for anything and else. Is there any way of telling if these are actions of feeding or actions of attack? Is this something that brings an animal down or is it something that's happening while they're sort of trying to scrape all the food off? So so not directly, but again, you can make some good inferences. So an old trace would, would have healed. If the animal survived and lived for days, weeks, months later, we would see healing on the bone. We see that for loads of them. Not here in this case, actually. In fact, I don't think we found any heal, healed bites, which in itself is intriguing. But when you do see healing, it, it's really, really clear. So whether or not something was... Post-mortem, the animal was dead, or peri-mortem, the animal was very close to death, i.e. this pretty much killed it. In theory, impossible to say, because you wouldn't get healing either way. But what you can look at is where those bites were and what that likely means. So in one case, for example, we found it on like the face of a vertebra. Well, of course, those, you know, normally vertebrae, you know, part of the backbone or the tail, slot together face to face. If you're getting bite marks on the face of one of them, you can pretty much only do that if those two bones have been pulled apart. Now, you could have had a very bloody killing of a sauropod, but I still don't think an allosaur managed to basically lever the tail in half and jam its teeth oh, down the front think, of well, one of think, those bones. You've got bones. one allosaur on one end, pulling on the head, the other one pulling on the tail, ripping <laughs> half, third allosaur comes in... <laughs> There you go. Well, right. And then that's the first bit. It's going to... Th right. So things like that, you know, we can say... And again, we had some like... I think there was one like on the head of the femur. Again, that would be in the acetabulum, in the hip socket. You can only really do that when the carcass is falling apart. Or, you know, some others, maybe like on the tips of toes. Okay, it's possible if you're trying to pull one of these animals down, you're biting on the tips of toes or, you know, grabbing other random bits like, like the shoulder but in in practice it seems very very unlikely and again we are mostly talking about adult sauropods here the smallest of which are very very big um. animals you know 10 tons plus very very large individuals far far bigger than the carnivores that are going after them there are bites higher than those carnivores could reach if that animal was standing up and alive so you know this is not going to be 
the first part or a major part of the attack. You could pretty much only do this when the animal was already down on the ground. And again, if you're trying to do a killing blow on the inside of the femur when the animal is already flat on the ground, you're probably not going about it the right way. So these aren't really what we'd expect to see. And that's true of pretty much all of them. There, There is nothing obvious bite-wise in the kind of areas we have predicted that they would attack based on what we know about carnivory patterns. So again, going for those base of the legs type stuff. Is there it's just basically a certain size that a sauropod gets and it be- is basically immune to attack and it's only once it's ill and sick and dying that they can be eaten. So that's another major factor is um, I don't think that, yeah, normally the theropods that are around in the Morrison, theropods generally are attacking big, healthy adult herbivores because animals don't do that. I've written extensively about this this is exactly what we see as a pattern. It's it's a mammalian pattern, but you also see it in crocs, you see it in birds, you see it in starfish, you see it in praying mantis, huge list of species that do this. And yet, very large herbivores are, in general, more or less immune to predation because they're really, really big and they're fundamentally hard to kill. And even a group of big allosaurs or big torvosaurus or something like this, yeah, maybe they could bring them down. Maybe a few evolved to do this or a certain group did, but in practice... It leaves you very, very vulnerable because you've got to remember for a carnivore, every time you are going in for a kill, you have a risk of injury. And if you are injured, that's pretty much game over. You really want to take out stuff that you can take out quickly and effectively with as little risk to you as possible. Maybe you're absolutely desperate. Maybe you make a horrible miscalculation for how vulnerable something is. But in general, they they just don't do it. And so, yeah, big sauropods, yeah, they're fat, yeah, they're slow, yeah, they don't have a lot of obvious defences and armour and shark claws and stuff, but just being hit by the tail or being kicked by the foot or them rearing up and trying to stamp on you, if they do, you're probably going to get crippled or killed, so don't do it. Not least when there were hordes and hordes and hordes of baby sauropods (laughs) out there for every big adult sauropod, which have none of those advantages of being fundamentally huge, but all the vulnerability of being relatively slow. I was just thinking, the only species that I can think of that actually actively goes after the largest and most like vicious animal, you know, in terms of like the are conservationists trying to like kill the like buck deer <laughs> or the like, large white rhino that's yeah. killing all of the offspring and stuff. So it's it's yeah, and we're the only that's the only time I can think of anything that does that. There's a group of lions in Ngorogoro that do hunt elephants, but even then they're mostly going after relatively young elephants and it's clearly a rare behavioural quirk. Most things don't do this. And again, it, even then, it's only part of their prey. It's not like they're elephant specialists. It's just that they can. I think I've mentioned you know, a story I've heard from a um, park ranger in, in South Africa of a single male lion who was repeatedly hunting bull water buffalo on his own, which is just <laughs> insane and should lead to the lion being just a red smear in the gla- grass the first time he tried it, let alone it becoming a habit. But these are exceptions, not the rule. And when you're looking at major patterns across probably a couple of million years with the spread of data that we've got and all the different species and all the different populations and all the different areas. If that was a big, big pattern, we would see evidence of it. And we're not, so it it probably isn't a thing. And yeah, my best guess is, yeah, it's going to happen, but big sauropods are fundamentally immune to predation because they're big (laughs) sauropods. That, that's all there yeah, is to it. it must be quite a nasty end when all the scavengers come when you're too sick to stand. That'd be horrible. Oh, yeah. And and we see it with elephants and we see it with other things. And, you know, you get the animals trapped in mud or tar pit type stuff. And yeah, it, it absolutely happens. So yes, it, it would be not fun yeah. for the animals concerned. But again, is, is that normal? Are healthy sauropods being hunted? Basically, I don't think they are. And that leads into one of the other things we did. So Christoph Hendricks, who's on the paper... For those who know of Christoph's work, he really is a sauropod. A sauropod. He really is a sauropod. He's amazing. He's so tall. Yeah. <laughs> so, those who know Christoph's work, he really is a theropod tooth guy. Like, that's his real interest and that's what he does. So Christoph had a look at two different things that fed into this bigger paper and that's why he's in there. So one of the things I've looked at in the past is the, you know, the gaps between these teeth marks and then trying to work out what carnivore may have left them. And I've said, I think this is really dodgy and we shouldn't do it because you just need a wobbly tooth 
or you just need the head to be at a slight angle and it will alter all of those spacings and then that's probably pretty meaningless. Anybody who's watched enough like murder crime scene, there's been a whole thing in America where it's like, oh, this person left bite marks on the victim and we can tell it's this person's bite mark and then they find out later that you can't tell anything from bite marks. It's a nightmare. At all. Yeah. Um, so that was one thing, but Christoph wanted to revisit it and said, I totally see where you're coming from. And yes, there are lots of caveats to this, but some of those spacings and some of the numbers of teeth are, uh, and size of them are unique enough that even if you account for that, you can probably still pull a couple of them apart. Great. So that, that's in there. Uh, inevitably, what we found is those are very few and far between because, again, you've got this size overlap problem. So, you know, a slightly smaller Torvosaurus or a slightly bigger Ceratosaurus heavily overlaps with Allosaurus. And then once you allow for a bit of error, it's very, very hard to say. There, there were out of, out of our 68 bones that have something like 70 odd different sets of marks on them. So not, not just a single trace, but there could be 10 or 12 little scratches in a row. We'd call that one kind of block. Uh, so there could be a couple of hundred of those individual marks on a single bone. I say a couple of hundred, I'm now thinking, I think the most we have was like 50. But still, you know, that's multiple lots of bites going onto a, a single skeletal element. But yeah, there were three or four where we were fairly confident of what species it was. But out of 68, it's not great. So it is very, very hard to say. More importantly, Christoph did a really cool survey of teeth that we have and how much wear the ends of those teeth have mm. had. Now, that's interesting and important because that gives you an idea of how much bone they are biting. So tyrannosaurs, very big, thick teeth, but the tips of them famously wear quite readily, and we think that's because they are regularly biting bone. Now, what we find with these sauropod-feeding animals is actually they're showing similar levels of wear to what we're seeing in the tyrannosaurs. Now, that would imply they're biting bones at a very similar rate. And remember, tyrannosaurs are big bone biters. You know, these take chunks out of bone regularly. Those famous removed big chunks of bone are tyrannosaurs. They can really bite bone in a way we think none of these other theropods could. Although they couldn't do it, they just weren't doing it that much. And certainly couldn't tackle really big bones the way tyrannosaurs could. And yet they're showing similar levels of wear. And yet the bones we're looking at don't have that many bites on them. Getting close to the tyrannosaur numbers, but not really as much. And then the individual bites aren't as deep and things like that. So how does that fit? And actually, it probably fits together quite well with exactly the sort of stuff we've just been saying. They're not fundamentally feeding on big sauropods. They will if you find a dead one. They'll probably quite happily kill one that's very ill, but mostly they're not actually going after them. What they are going after is the juvenile sauropods, and just like we've talked about for other dinosaur faunas as well, juveniles should be making up most of the population. And by juvenile, we don't just mean something hatched out of the egg and six foot long and weighs 10 kilos. I still mean juvenile, I mean a ton or less, maybe even three or can four just, tons or less. Can I just, can I just say... Six foot long and weighs 10 kilos, and it's... Because, obviously, they've still got the really long necks and really long tails at that point. Yeah. Because otherwise, in my head, I was just like, what? I mean, that wouldn't be a hatchling out of the egg. That would be a few I months know, old. I know, but that's still but Still nuts. very... <laughs> yeah. I mean, a, a, right, but a, a six foot long sauropod, as you say, it's it's mostly neck and tail. It would be, you know... Okay, I'm mixing my, my numbers here, but, you know, the hips would be 50, 60 centimetres off the ground, two foot off the ground. It's, it's not... Know, you know, 10 it's, kilos is nothing. not much more than knee high. I mean, I mean, I know they're pneumatic <laughs> and stuff. They've got air in their bones, which makes them really light. But what? That's really light. Yeah. So, right. So when I'm talking about juvenile sauropods, I don't just mean tiny little babies. I mean potentially very big animals. But, yeah, probably three quarters plus of the population is animals like that. In other words, you round up 100 sauropods you might have 20 that were adult size, 10 ton Camarasaurus, Diplodocus, Apatosaurus, plus whatever, and 80 with similar number that were two tons, a similar number that were one ton, and then 50, 60 that are anything from, you know, 500 kilos down to 10 kilos. A pyramid of herbivores. Pretty much. Yeah. Um, and so that's what a real pop living population probably looked like. But the fossil record doesn't show that. What the fossil record has is adults and no juveniles. Why? Because the juveniles were being eaten. And if you're trying to eat a 10 or 20 ton sauropod, 
with a femur that, or a humerus that's, yeah, a meter and a half long and solid bone, because you mentioned pneumatic bones, but not the limb bones aren't, you are not going to destroy them. At best, you're going to leave some tooth marks on them. If it's a baby where that bone is smaller than the rib of an adult, and we know they can bite through them because we have bitten through ribs, you can just crunch the whole thing up and, and swallow it in chunks. And what will that do? Well, it will wear your teeth down, but also it eliminates that thing from the fossil record. It can't be buried and become a fossil if it's been broken up into bits and digested and come out the other end in, in fragments. So the absence of juvenile sauropods in the fossil record matches the damage to the teeth, which then doesn't match the damage on the bones of the big ones because they are not normally being fed on. And so we actually think that integrates really quite nicely into this general understanding of sauropod and the dinosaur populations that are juvenile dominated, but also the carnivores are feeding on those juveniles and effectively eliminating them from the fossil record. So just record. to get that point in my head, is the fact that we have worn down teeth, but we don't have that many bite marks on bones... <laughs> means that they are eating... They were damaging infants. or something that's else. That's a really lovely jump. And all the babies yeah, are missing. that's a really lovely jump yeah. that you can, you know, get that sort of impression. That's, that's a, that that, yeah, that it, makes it satisfying. Cause it, cause it, it, that's nice. And it's one of those odd things where we were puzzling over this because we're going to go, well, that doesn't match. Why doesn't that match? And, of course, it doesn't immediately leap out at you because it's the absence yeah. of something which is what's driving it. And, of course, I've worked this out eventually having been, frankly, one of the main proponents of the argument that juveniles are being artificially eliminated, or not artificially, naturally eliminated from the fossil record. It should have come to me much sooner. Published the papers on this in 2007, <laughs> <eight>. It's 15-year-old <laughs> work that I did, and it took me a surprising number of weeks you're to You're a scientist, it. Dave. You're used to evidence ruining your life, not helping you. No, that's very that's very true. So, yeah, that that's pretty much the summary of it. There are more bites on sauropods in general than we think. Quite what that means in terms of overall feeding, it's very hard to say because of these horrible interlinked caveats in places. But again, even my gap more which is considered grossly unrepresentative, is only at kind of normal tyrannosaur level. So pretty much on average, these bites are rarer than tyrannosaurs, whilst more common than we previously thought. We've done a really extensive and exhaustive survey about as much as you could reasonably be expected to do, but I really hope other people are going to delve into some other collections because all that data is published now. You can just take what we've already done, bolt some more stuff on it and reanalyze it or do analyses that we didn't do. We can probably do a bit more in terms of interpreting some of the patterns of bite marks in terms of aligning them to specific species. Not as much as we would like, but certainly we're better at it than I personally had said, you know, I just don't think we can do this. I just don't think we should do this. I would now agree with my colleagues and go, okay, under the right circumstances, you can probably at least do a few. And again, that's going to be useful sooner or later when you look at things like, you know, I think in Mongolia where we've got Tarbosaurus, but you've also got other rather smaller tyrannosaurs. Maybe we can pick them apart then when they've got different numbers of teeth in the jaw as well, if we're careful. So again, that could be some more use. Overall, these theropods are basically doing what we thought. They are not fundamentally killing big sauropods. They are not fundamentally massive scavengers and really pulling apart skeletons and biting them absolutely everywhere like a tyrannosaur would because we're not seeing those bites even on the very well bitten ones and the places that they're accessing are normally kind of on the outside and a bit more accessible exactly what you do if you came across a body and you just wanted a chomp on I it i do bit. that most days well quite and and remember and this is part of that point you know even if like 21 ton allosaurs turned up to a dead sauropod that's still a 20 ton sauropod that's your own body weight in food each even if you eliminate the skeletons that half your body weight in food eat you could spend a week eating that and not get close to the bones because you're just chucking away at meat and meat and meat and meat so this is probably why we're not getting quite as many bites there but it all actually lines up when you look at the tooth wear stuff and you look at the population stuff and the return rate stuff that yeah that they're, they're doing exactly what probably other carnivores were doing they're favoring going after juveniles and mostly not going after the adults. And when they do, it's scavenging because they're already dead. 
and they're already decaying and that's why you can get into bits of the skeleton that you couldn't before. So that's pretty much it. But if you want more details, the paper is out in PRJ, so it's a fully open access journal. The data and the whole paper is 100% accessible and it's like 25 pages long or 30 pages long. It's a great big long paper. And then all the supplementary data as well, all the graphs and all the pages and pages and pages of numbers and cataloging of all the bytes. There's a huge amount of stuff in there. And yeah, we are still sort of skimming over the surface, even in this report. That sounds very good, Dave. That sounds like a good use of your time. So well done. Well done. I'll I'll applaud myself. As happens with papers like this, you know, we've talked about this kind of project before. We have a roundtable discussion. Someone goes, you know, I think there's something in the teeth here with those scrape feedings. And Dave, you're the theropod guy really on this project. And I'm like, yeah, but the thing is, at this point, again, haven't been to Utah. Do not have good data sets on any of these taxa. Even post Utah, I still haven't seen Torvosaurus because I missed it. We need to get someone in who's got this data. Well, Christoph's got that data. We'll see if he's interested. You email Christoph. Yeah, yeah, I've got some of that data, but not everything you need. I'll have to go away and measure it. And so he's gone for like three, four months gathering the data and then analyzing it and then presenting it to us. And then we're trying to fit it into the paper and go, oh, but that means this. We should go and look at that. And lo and behold, another three months pass. And, you know, that's how these things work. And so, yeah, it, it expands and extends in lots of interesting ways at different times. And you're adding in collaborators and then adding in new data and then adding in new studies. And it produces... I think, you know, overall, a really pretty good paper. But there's a reason it took literally years to come together, even if the majority of that data collection was done in a couple of months because of everything that went into it. One of my scientific heroes is Caroline Herschel, who did all the sort of sky maps. She went out there and did the, the, the measuring basically finding the comet, yeah. working out what was a comet, what wasn't a comet, while her skirt froze, because she did this all in the late, sort of like, 19th, 18th century. Was it, was it cold? Yeah. It was a bit cold, yeah. It was a bit cold, because that's the night you need to go out sky gazing when there's no clouds, you see, and in winter, great skies. Yes. So yeah, no, so she did she did all that, but they're still using those sky maps. So like in 200 years, they might still reference this paper because they want to know about, you know, yeah. and that's the beauty of it. It's it's the whole standing on the um, shoulders of giants, isn't it? It's actually the little bricks in the wall that make up the, you know, that hold up future research. So well done, Dave, yeah, um, but also thank you. poor Abbas. <laughs> <laughs> and Emmanuel, and Emmanuel. he did a fair bit. Yes. And then Chris... And then Christoph measuring yeah. his teeth. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a lot. Me, me Matt and uh, Mark Morell got a fairly light. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done, everyone. Thank you very much for listening. As always, if you want to become a patron, we are doing, um, we're going to record it right now, a questions episode. And you can send in your questions to that. You can get in touch, terriblelizards at gmail.com. Or you can go to our Patreon, uh, patreon.com forward slash terrible lizards. I'm about to tell you all of that in the outro, but I reckon hardly any of you listen to that because you think, oh, what's something else? I don't need to hear as he says, stay stompy. So, after three, Dave, we will go rawr. One, two, three. Rawr. Thank you for listening to Terrible Lizards. For extra content, please go to patreon.com forward slash terrible lizards. For questions, contact us there or on terriblelizardspod at gmail.com. Buy Dave Hone's dinosaur books, including How Fast Did T-Rex Run? And to find out about Izzy's podcasts and books, head to iszi.com. Say hello on social media using the hashtag TerribleLizards. Thank you so much for listening. A review, a recommend and a follow makes all the difference. Stay stompy.